Well, hello and welcome back to another episode. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today we're continuing with our series on writing a ray tracer in C++ using as far as possible only the standard libraries and the SDL2 libraries so that we can display results in a window. So this particular episode is part three of the short mini series that I've been doing looking at normal maps or bump maps as they're somehow called, which is a basic technique for allowing a greater surface detail to be introduced without having to add actual geometry. If you haven't seen the previous two episodes, I strongly suggest you go back and have a look at those before continuing with this one, because I'm not going to go over uh, any of the background material again. In this episode, what I want to focus on is the use of image-based normal maps. Now, if you've looked on any of the uh, plethora of websites or the many websites there are out there that uh, offer free textures, in particular the ones that offer free PBR or physical base rendering textures, you will have seen that quite often they'll have um, what's often described as the albedo for a texture, which is basically the color, and then they have a variety of other things, one of which is a normal map. And these normal map images are very distinctive. They look something like the image you can see here behind me. And they are usually the shade of blue with some pink or green shades going on. And uh, yeah, they can be a little bit confusing. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to use or how to work with these kinds of normal map images so that it's possible to download textures from any of these free websites or whatever and apply those along with the albedo, the color, and the normal map to whatever objects you want. So that's that's what we're talking about today, which hopefully will be of interest. So just before I begin, I want to say, as I always do, that if you like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you don't have to miss any future videos. Thank you very much. Right, without much further ado, let's jump into it and let's have a look at image-based normal maps. So I wanted to start just with some uh, brief demonstrations that really show uh, what's going on. So what I've done is I've used GIMP, actually, which is a free open source image, ed image editing software available for Linux or Windows. If you want to do the same thing, easy to get hold of that. And I just use it to create some patterns. And then I've used it also. It has a feature to create normal maps, which is very convenient. So this example here, this is a very simple sine wave pattern. Uh, which you can see going on. So the basic texture looks like this and the normal map looks like this. Okay, And then when you apply those together to a surface, you get what the result that you can see here. And you can see that as we move the sample point here indicated by these two arrows, the purple arrow shows the normal of the actual plane, which of course always points in the same direction. And the green arrow shows the direction of the normal that has been displaced by the normal map. And you can see how that uh, uh, works for that sinusoidal pattern and you can see how the displacements to the green arrow to the normal um, are reflected by the uh, reflections <laughs> that you can see going on in that image. Okay, so another example, this is exactly the same thing. This is a simple Voronoi pattern. Again, I created this with GIMP and created a normal map to go with it, also using GIMP. And you can see how uh, the uh, surface normal is perturbed by that texture and by, well, by that normal map uh, in a similar way to the sine wave. And you can sort of start to see the potential of this technique. Um, and finally, the last example, this is an image I got from uh, a texture, sorry, a texture and a normal corresponding normal map that I got from textures.com. You can go on there, register, it's free, make a free account and you can download uh, textures from there. And um, there are obviously other websites available, you don't have to use that one. But this is a basic terracotta floor pattern and it just sort of shows the potential. I mean, obviously, if you didn't have the normal map, this would just be a flat texture. But with the normal map, it really makes everything a lot more interesting. Okay, so there we go. That is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to take a look at how to actually implement code to make these normal maps work. Now, the first thing that I wanted to talk about, though, before we dive into that, is how do these images actually work? Because if you look at the basic normal map image, they're kind of strange. They're all the shade of blue and everything else. So what exactly is going on? Let's take a look. So the basic premise is that we have three dimensional vectors. So we have an X, Y and a Z and we want to displace our normal vector in 
either or all of those directions. So we need three numbers. Now that's very convenient because a picture, an, RG, an image is an RGB image, so it has a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. So logic suggests that we can use the red channel, say, to represent the X displacement, the Y channel to represent the, the sorry, the green channel to represent the Y displacement, and the blue channel to represent the Z displacement. Now, in fact, that is exactly what's going on with these normal map images. Now, the reason they're always blue is because the uh, Z value is displaced. We don't allow negative Z values, okay? So, and also bear in mind, we're dealing with integer images. Normal image files store the pixel values, color values as integers, so 0 to 255. And the common practice is to displace the uh, blue value to be 128, so exactly halfway uh, everywhere, representing no displacement in Z. And that's what gives the uniform blue color. So the blue value uh, representing Z, we don't allow a negative displacement of Z because that would obviously point the normal away from the camera and we're not interested in that condition. So we use the full range of values that we have for the blue channel to represent a displacement to the Z direction of the normal of 0 to uh, 1. So that's all of 0 to 255, the 8-bit integer values that we can have for our blue channel. The red and the green channels are slightly different. These are uh, shifted up to a value of 128 representing 0. And the reason for this is because we can have a positive or a negative displacement. So we want to be able to encode values between minus 1 and 1. And so we encode those. 0 would be a value of, a color of 0 would be um, a value of zero, sorry, in the red channel would be a minus one displacement in X. A value of uh, 128 in the red channel would be zero displacement in X. And a value of 255 in the red channel would be a displacement of positive one in X. Okay, and so on for green, just the same. So the red and the green values are shifted up to 128 uh, like so. And this explains the basic pale blue color that you get when there's really sort of no displacement going on because you have a Z value of 1, so that would be 255, so full blue, and then red and green are both 128 or 50%. So you're 50% red, 50% green, 100% blue, you're going to get a pale blue color. Okay, so the following examples uh, just show some examples of how that works. In this first example, we have a gradient here applied. Uh, we have the base, I've just used the image as the texture, um, and then I'm using the image also was the normal map. Okay, so we have this gradient here. This is a gradient in X. And the X value here ranges from 0 on the left to 100 on the right. And the Y value is fixed at 50. And you can see how the color of that gradient changes. Okay, and then as we move our sample point along, this is exactly the same method of display that we used before. You can see how the uh, normal vector is displaced. How the green vector is moving according to where we are on that gradient. Okay, and another example, if we look at this, this one shows a gradient in Y. So in this case, we fix the value of X at 50, or 50%, 50 I should say, <laughs> 128 in, in um, the actual values. And we're varying the value of Y between 0 and 100 as we go from left to right as before. And again, you can see how the colors vary in the gradient. Okay, and the final example shows the same thing, and this shows an XY gradient. So we have X of 0 and Y of 0 on the left, and X of 100% and Y of 100% on the right. And you can see, obviously, the effect that that has on the normal. So this shows the range of colors that you get in these normal map images, and it shows how those colors relate to what we're actually doing to the normal. And that really, I think, <laughs> explains everything really that you need to know about how these uh, normal maps work. They are actually really that simple. We'll see a little bit more when we come to look at the code. Um, hopefully that will become more clear. Now I want to show just one final example that shows, I think, a big limitation of the normal map approach, which is that you know, normally you can really only use these normal maps to model fairly small displacements. And I think this example shows why. If we make the plane here reflective, like so, so that now you can see the impact of the displacement to the normal on the reflections, um, then everything looks fine up until this point here on the right where things go a little bit strange. So what exactly is going on there? Why, why does that happen? If we cast a ray from the camera, like so, down to the point, say, in the, the center here where the marker is, and then we cast out the, the reflected ray from there, we see that that, in this position, passes out through the blue sphere uh, exactly as we would expect. And of course, that's why the pixel at this location is colored blue, because it's picking up the color from the blue sphere. 
Now, if we move to the right to the trouble area, you can see that as we move, the reflected ray is getting more and closer and closer to being parallel with the floor, with the, fl the floor plane, right? As we move beyond the beginning of the troublesome area, you can see that what is actually happening now is that the reflected ray is moving below the floor, which obviously makes no sense, right? And that is why we get this breakdown of the reflective properties and then we get this sudden change and then this area that appears to make no sense. Now we can prove that if we move the camera up then obviously we're changing all the angles and you can see that once the camera reaches a certain height then the reflected ray comes back up above the uh, floor plane and things look normal again. You can see as the camera moves up the region that is uh, wrong, the erroneous region, is getting smaller. Okay and finally if we move the camera back all the all the way, move the point of interest all the way back the other way, you can see obviously how the reflected ray varies according to the displaced normal, which is exactly what you would expect. Okay, so this really just serves, I think, as a neat example about how normal maps are very powerful and they can do really great things, um, but you have to be a bit careful using them if you go too extreme with how you're applying the displacement or too big displacements, then things rapidly stop making sense, okay? <laughs> and you can get some really uh, quite strange things going on in your image. So, you know, it, it pays just to be a little bit careful if you're designing your own normal maps. If you, if you look at the ones that you can download with textures, you'll find actually the displacements to the normal that they encode are all really tiny, and this is the reason why, okay? It's really just about adding um, small surface detail, not about adding big features. If you need to add big features to the surface, really you need to be changing your surface geometry, not simply messing about with normal maps. Okay, right, well that's everything for the introduction. So I suggest the next thing we do, let's jump in and let's have a look at the code that I've written to actually make this work. Okay, so just to start off, as always, I'm at my terminal window, and this is the uh, main folder for the project. If you've been diligently following along, or you've simply cloned the repository from GitHub, which is fine, you could do that, uh, then this is what you should have, or at least something similar. And you can see in this folder, I've got two bitmap images here, voronoi.bitmap and voronoi.normal.bitmap. These are the image files I'm using for the demonstration. I'm not going to provide these. Uh, you can use any textures you like, download from any of the free website, websites that offer free textures that you can use, or as I said, use GIMP to create your own. Uh, that's fine. Uh, yep, and not a problem. So the Voronoi bitmap we've already seen, it's here, that's the actual texture, and Voronoi normal is the normal map to go with it. Okay, fine. If we go into the QB ray trace folder itself, and go into QB normals, where we're storing all our code for normal maps. Then you can see I've created two new files here, image.hpp and image.cpp. Okay, so exactly the same name as the class we have for image-based textures, but of course we're in the normal namespace, so we can do that, that's not a problem. Interestingly enough, someone did point out there was a bug with my implementation of image-based textures, uh, which meant that you had to, bitmap images had to be four bytes per pixel. If they were three bytes per pixel, it would simply uh, throw an exception and crash. Uh, I fixed that, so we're gonna talk about that as well when we come to look at the code. And also, I'm for the sake of doing normal maps, I'm implementing bilinear interpolation when we process the image, and I've added that same functionality to the image texture class as well, and I will briefly mention that when we come to it. Okay, so let's go back to our root folder. So let's have a look at the code. So this is the HPP file, the header file for the image.hpp in the uh, normal namespace. And it's really pretty simple. We obviously have our QBRT namespace and the normal sub namespace, we click class image, uh, which inherits from normal base. Now I've talked about normal base before, so go back and watch the previous two episodes um, if you haven't seen them to understand about that. So we overload the, we have our constructor, sorry, and we override our destructor as always. And we have a function to load the image, except a string as input for the file name, and we have a function to compute the perturbation that we're overriding from the uh, base class, so I've talked about that before. And then in our private section here, we have functions to handle interpolation. Now, I am implementing bilinear interpolation. I talked about this at the beginning when we started looking at um, procedural textures. Okay, so we use bilinear interpolation as part of the uh, procedural texture code, so I'm not going to talk about how that works here. If you want to, go back and have a look at the procedural texture video, and it's all explained there. Okay, 
So, but we have functions, a linear interpolation function, and then, of course, a bilinear interpolation function that accepts the four corners of the point that we want to interpolate within and, it and the actual value, the actual coordinate, and it returns the value. It's simple. We have a function get pixel value, and this does what you'd expect. It returns the value of a pixel at a particular location um, as four doubles representing red, green, blue, and alpha. We have a flag here for reverse x, y. This simply allows you to control which way x and y. So, for example, 100% red could represent positive 1 in x, but you might also want it to represent negative 1 in x, depending on your coordinate system. So that uh, flag simply allows you to do that. And then in the private section, we have our standard stuff for dealing with textures and normal maps and everything we've talked about before. We have our transform matrix. Uh, this bit labeled to be deleted, yes, that's left over from something else. I'll leave it in for now. And then our stuff to handle um, the uh, SDL2 stuff, okay? So that's, that's I've talked about that sort of thing before. Uh, one thing to note, uh, we do, yeah, no, I've talked about that before, that's fine. Okay, that's everything for image.hpp. Let's have a look at image.cpp. Here we go. Okay, so this is the CPP file. Um, we hash include image.hpp that we've just been talking about. Of course, we have our constructor and our destructor. At the moment, we are initializing a random number generator here. We do not need that. <laughs> to illustrate that, I'm simply going to take that out. Okay, we, we don't need that for anything. It's left over from a previous version of the code, so apologies for that. And we have our code that computes the actual perturbation of the surface normal. Uh, before I talk about that, let's just jump down to uh, load image. So this is a function to load an image. It accepts as input a string with the file name. First thing it does, check if an image has been loaded already. If it has, then we use the SDL free surface to free the image surface, okay? Um, we store the file name and the image surface like so. If we don't have an image surface after loading using the SDL load bitmap function, okay, that's what actually loads the bitmap. That's why we're limited to bitmaps because I'm using SDL2's functions to do in handle image reading. It doesn't support PNGs. It would be nice, but we can work with bitmaps, it's okay. If that didn't work, then we display a message that we failed to load the image. Otherwise, we continue and we extract the useful information. We want the width, height, the pitch, format, and bytes per pixel, uh, like so. And we set our flag to say that image loaded is true, and we return true, okay? We then have our function to get a particular pixel value. So this will return the value of a pixel at the location given by x and y. Uh, this is not doing interpolation, okay? This is literally reading at integer values of x and y, okay? Um, the first thing that it does simply is check that we're inside the image. Uh, we convert x, y to a linear index in bytes. Okay, I've talked about this before. Go back to the, the video on image textures, actually. Um, gives re really quite a detailed explanation of how this works. And uh, one thing that is different is that now I'm storing the pixel array as uint8. So we're reading in all of the raw bytes as uint8. And then we're extracting the current pixel value. I'm using an STD array consisting of four bytes, four uint8 uh, bytes uh, called byte values. And we're simply going to read those in. We just do a loop over the number of bytes per pixel, uh, which is going to be either three or four. And we set byte values at i, that's i there, uh, is equal to the value of pixel array, the pixel index plus i. Okay straightforward. So pixel index we get from here, and then so if we've got four bytes per pixel, we read in pixel index plus zero, pixel index plus one, plus two, and plus three, okay? And then we need to actually assemble the final pixel value. So we need a uint32 to represent the actual value of our pixel, um, yep, which is defined here. So we define the uint32 here for our current pixel, initially set the value to zero, and depending on the number of bytes per pixel we have, we're supporting three bytes, which is RGB, or four bytes, RGBA, alpha. Um, for uh, our case, we can't handle anything else at the moment, maybe a limitation, but you can see how you can add more. So in the case that we have three bytes per pixel, we assemble current pixel as being byte value at zero uh, with the bitwise or of uh, byte values at one bit shifted by eight bitwise or byte values at two um, bit shifted by 16. And similarly for four, you can see how that works there. Now, there might be some limitations. I'm running on Linux and it's possible if you're using Windows that the Endian encoding is different. Uh, be aware of that, uh, might need a change there. I should write this code to be <laughs> a little more universal. I will look at tidying that up later, but uh, for now, just be, just be aware of that. If your colors are wrong, it's because the Endian encoding uh, needs to be changed. Or if you're normal maps look wrong. And then we convert that to RGB. 
uh, here we go, using SDL, get RGBA, current pixel, M image surface format. So we're getting that from there, RGBA that we've read in uh, from, uh, yeah, so we store, sorry, yes, we're extracting from current pixel that we've assembled here, this uint32 value, and we're putting the values into RGB and A, which are uint8 uh, bytes, like so, okay? Okay, straightforward. I think SDL2 might take care of the Endian encoding with this because it's handling, it's using the format. You, you might value why, you might wonder why not just use the byte values that we've read here. And the reason is, is because we need to be careful. We want them in the right format to go with our um, image surface format. So we're using SDL, get RGBA, to extract those from the UINT32. And it, I think possibly it does take care of the Endian encoding, but I'm not absolutely sure. So just, just be aware of that. And then I've written this as return the color, which is kind of what we're doing, but we do do a little bit of processing. So we static cast our colors to double, because at the moment they're UINT8. We subtract 128. Okay, so we're going to get values there between minus 128 and plus 127, I think. And then we divide by 128. So we're going to get a float that varies between minus 1 and 1. Okay, for R and G. And B, we simply divide by 255. So we get a value between 0 and 1 for that. Okay. And that's that. And then we have our functions to handle interpolation. I said I wasn't really going to talk about that. This basically just implements, uh, in linear interpolation, we implement the basic formula for linear interpolation. Bilinear interpolation simply performs three linear interpolations to uh, give the final result. Okay, that's that. So let's go back to the actual bit that does the work. So this is the interesting function here that computes the perturbation, okay? So this accepts as input the normal that we're going to perturb. It will return a vector output, which is the perturbed normal, and it accepts as input a vector containing the UV coordinates. We initially define x, d, y, d, and z, d for the displacement in x, y, and z to zero, all of those. If an image has been loaded, um, we do that. If it hasn't, we actually don't do anything. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we apply the local transform. It's, I've talked about that extensively in, in, in how we process textures and normal maps are the same. And I did talk about that a little bit at the first of this three part series as well. Uh, we have a slightly different method of modular arithmetic compared to what I did previously for the image texture class. We simply f mod u and v with one. So that means they are limited to be between minus one and plus one. And they will simply tile effectively if we go over that. We then convert the UV coordinates to image dimensions. And that's really pretty straightforward. I don't think I really need to talk through that. And then we perform the bilinear interpolation. Okay, so yes, one thing it is interesting to talk about, X and Y are our positions within the particular square that we want um, because we're going to do bilinear interpolation. And then X min, Y min, X max, and Y max give the positions of the four corners uh, around uh, that particular point. Okay, we define R0, G0, B0, and A0, and do that for R1, R2, R3, and G1, G2, and so on. Uh, we use the get pixel value function, uh, first with X min, Y min, first corner, and it gets the values into R0, G0, B0, and A0, and then we do for X max, Y min, X min, Y max, and X max, Y max, and you can see that's going to be the four corners, and that gives us our four values. And then we're going to use bilinear interpolation. We only bother with the three channels. We don't need to worry about alpha for this. So we interp r is equal to the bilinear interpolation from x min y min r0, x max y min r1, x min y max r2, x max y max r3, and then xf and yf are our actual position. And then we do exactly the same for um, g and b. And then we simply return those. Those are the values we're going to use. So we say x d is interp r, y d interp g, and z d is interp b. Okay. If our reverse flag is set, then we negate x and x d and y d. Otherwise, we simply create our perturbation vector or perturbation uh, initialized with the values of x d, y d, and z d, and we return the result of perturb normal, normal, and perturbation. Now the perturb normal function comes from the normal base class, so that's described. Uh, at the beginning of my little mini series on normal maps. Okay, that is actually everything that we need to implement image based normal maps. Now, I mentioned that I also made some changes to the image based texture class, so let's just have a quick look at that. So, what I've done is this is the HPP file for the uh, 
image texture class, okay? And really all I've done is added the same private functions that we've created just now for the image-based normal map class, which are linear interp, bilinear interp, and get pixel value, okay? Otherwise, everything else is the same. And the reason I wanted to do this is really you should have bilinear interpolation when handling image textures. Previously, I had just done nearest neighbor. Uh, I think it's time for an upgrade. So let's look at the CPP file for this. So this is uh, image.cpp, so this is the image-based texture class CPP file. And most of this is still the same. Uh, with the, I changed the way we're handling tiling, okay? And all of this code is now exactly what we've just seen for the normal maps, which is much neater. And we're using the getPixelValue function uh, and bilinear interpolation okay, in exactly the same way. The other thing that's changed is in the getPixelValue function that we're now using. Of course, this uses the same method of reading in our byte data as uint8 and then um, building the uint32 value. Now, the reason why this would crash before, it's really interesting, actually. If you, if you were to use this with the original code to read a 3 byte per pixel image. The problem was that it was trying to read a uint32, so it was always trying to extract four bytes from a three byte per pixel image, and obviously eventually that's going to create a segmentation fault because you're going to try and access a byte that you don't have access to, okay? <laughs> so the trick is to read the bytes individually uh, using as uint8 and then assemble the uint32 uh, yourself. It, it just a, it's a really interesting example actually. So this allows us to be compatible to read three bytes per pixel bitmaps or four byte per pixel bitmaps, okay? Which is, I think, better. Anyway, okay, there we go. Right. So the last thing to talk about is how do we set up a scene uh, just to demonstrate this. Okay, so this is the scene.hpp file. We don't need anything much here except that we have here hash include dot slash qb normal slash image dot hpp to bring in the new um, image based normal uh, map class. Okay, nothing else there has changed. Let's look at scene.cpp. Okay, here we go, scene.cpp. Um, we haven't changed a lot here. So camera, lighting, everything set the same. Um, uh, set up some color maps, create some textures. So here we go. So what I'm doing now to make this a bit different, we have an example image texture. So we create, we use auto image textures, std make shared, as we make a shared pointer to an instance of uh, the image texture class, okay? We load the Voronoi bitmap that was there in the file. You substitute change this for whatever file you want to use. Okay, uh, we and then set the transform. We're not doing any scaling or rotation or anything. Okay, okay, everything else then the same. There's a stone texture that we created in the previous episode. I right, did the other thing, and then we create here an image based normal map. Um, it's very similar syntax. The only difference here is the namespace. You see, this is coming from the normal sub namespace rather than the texture sub namespace. Otherwise, it's really identical. And I've done that on purpose. I like to try to be consistent uh, with how these things work. And in this case, we load Voronoi underscore normal dot bitmap. And again, we set that up. It's important to make sure any transforms, rotations, or scalings, or translations that you add to the normal map are the same. Uh, to the corresponding texture map, otherwise you're going to get some weird effects. Okay, you might want that, I suppose. But <laughs> um, okay, and then we simply assign image texture to the floor material, and we assign image normal uh, to the floor material as well, and that's all that we need to do. Otherwise, everything else here is the same. We set the floor uh, to assign the floor material to the floor, and that's it. Okay. So that is everything that we need to do. So let's go back to the terminal window. Let's compile our code, run it, and see what we get. Okay, so I'm back here. I'm at my main window. I'm going to run make. As anyone following my channel knows, I use gmake uh, to manage my builds. If you're running in an, an IDE, an integrated development environment of some sort, then it will probably handle this for you. Um, so, you know, use whatever, <laughs> whatever method you've got for your environment. Um, personally, I like gmake and doing stuff from the command line in Linux, but that's just me. Anyway, there we go. So let's run kubiray and let's have a look what we get. So we see the information. We've loaded a 1024 by 1024 bitmap with three bytes per pixel, a pitch of 3072. And... And there we go. So this is the same test image that we've been working with now for a while. Uh, the five balls here with their textures. And you can see that we have now mapped the Voronoi texture uh, onto the surface, onto the floor. And you can see that we've applied the Voronoi normal map as well. And that is having exactly the effect that we would expect. And 
I think that's really quite cool. And as you've seen in some of the examples that I've produced, particularly the animation that was behind me at the beginning, um, if you look at downloading textures or something like that, like brick textures or all sorts of material textures that you can get from, from you know, many websites that provide these for free, then that come with normal maps and things. And you can, we're really in a position now that we can start to make some really very interesting images. And I think it's really starting to get quite exciting. Um, there's quite a lot more to do. This is sort of beginning to get into the realms of physical base rendering and PBR. And that is the direction that I want to go down. A few things that we need to tidy up with the code base first. We'll see about that, particularly in the next episode. Um, but physical base rendering or PBR, I think, is where ray tracing or path tracing and whatever you want to use. In this example, we are dealing specifically with ray tracing. And I think it's where it really starts to get quite exciting because we're really starting to think about actually modeling how light is interacting with a specific surface. And we're getting into the realms of light transport modeling um, more than just sort of ray tracing. Ray tracing is a very simple technique of light transport modeling, uh, path tracing and these other techniques, photon mapping and you know so on for radiosity uh, rendering. They sort of take these things a little bit further, but they're all really approximations of the uh, the whole sort of light transport modeling problem. And it's quite exciting as we're uh, sort of getting closer to that. Anyway, I'm, that's me r rambled on for long enough there, I think. So that is everything that I wanted to talk about today. And that concludes my little mini series on normal maps for the time being. It's a, an issue, an area we might revisit uh, in the future, um, depending how it goes. And as I say, I will go on to, I want to go on to look at actually a full PBR implementation or implementing full PBR materials. But I think there's quite a lot we need to do before we can get to that. Anyway, listen, I really hope this video has been of interest. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it, so I, I hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful as well. If you liked it, please do remember to hit that like button, and if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so you don't have to miss any future videos. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's enough for me for today, so I will just say that I really look forward to seeing you in the next video. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>